1937, Professor Tolkien published The Hobbit, a story about Bilbo and a group of dwarves who embark on an adventure to reclaim their gold and homeland stolen by the dragon Smaug. In 1954, he published the sequel, The Lord of the Rings, in which Bilbo's nephew Frodo has to destroy the One Ring to defeat the Dark Lord Sauron. But because Tolkien had different ideas for this world, he revised The Hobbit in 1951. With that in mind, three years ago I made an hour-long video on the Hobbit trilogy. In it, I discuss some of the tentpole criticisms that everyone probably knows about. The overuse of CGI, invented characters, love triangles, and the overwhelming contradictions of making a prequel to the Lord of the Rings film series and adapting a children's book. These are all important criticisms, but since then I've regretted not sharing some subtler storytelling problems. If you're interested in those original criticisms, I recommend Lindsay Ellis' videos because she makes a better case than I did. She also details the production headaches that affected all of the films. Peter never got a chance to prep these movies. You can't, I can't say that. But he didn't. Which sounds like a one and done handicap, but it's more of a domino effect. They didn't have time to second guess their artistic choices like Bayorn's mullet. Once we started seeing it in lots of shots, it, it started to draw too much attention to itself. So we actually ended up flattening his mohawk and just bringing it in a little. And if there was a hiccup during shooting, like bad weather, they had to move on. So there we were, most magnificent location, shooting an actor against a massive big green screen. There were also originally going to be two films, but it was split into three in the middle of production, which meant they had to restructure the movies in post. So we get a rearrangement of antagonists and drawn out climaxes that hurt the pacing of the films. And of course there were plot threads mandated by the studio. Do you think she could have loved me? My original video was my first video essay, and inevitably there were some rookie mistakes. So in the vein of Tolkien rewrites, I want to revisit the films to offer my own perspective, with the freedom to throw in critical non sequiturs. Bilbo's sword doesn't glow half the time when orcs are present. Sometimes it looks like it's reflecting light as opposed to being a really bright blue. And on the subject of glowing swords, there are two other elven blades featured in the trilogy, Orcrist and Glamdring. But the filmmakers decided not to make them glow, which is totally fine. But when Gandalf uses Glamdring, the Goblin King says, He wields the foe hammer, the beater, bright as daylight. Which sounds like a description in the book, Bright as Blue Flame. It seems weird to me that he would call it Bright as Daylight when it's effectively an ordinary sword. When I watch the Hobbit trilogy, my overall takeaway is I'm not feeling what I'm supposed to feel. Or sometimes I don't know what I'm supposed to feel. Not every man's brave enough to wear a cold seat. In my first video, I said that the Hobbit films are remarkable, but they're only a failure in the shadow of The Lord of the Rings, a trilogy I consider perfect. What I meant was that we've been consuming similar blockbuster epics for years, films that are released and then forgotten about. But compared to other fantasy movies like Jack the Giant Slayer and Maleficent, the Hobbit trilogy is a step above your average production, but I think we're more critical of The Hobbit because The Lord of the Rings provides such a strong baseline to compare it to. It's hard not to. The Hobbit is begging for comparison. From the opening framework, familiar characters, cameos, set pieces, props, nods to future characters. That's my wee lad, Gimli. Is known in the wild as Strider. Copy and pasted scenes, and all of the references to the Rings of Power, Ringwraiths, and Sauron without a proper introduction or context in these films. So what makes The Lord of the Rings so damn good? I don't know if I can really describe it, but what I can say about The Lord of the Rings is that it makes you feel what you're supposed to feel. Character deaths hit you like a gut punch. As opposed to not that much. The Urukai are gross and disgusting in the best possible way. And the Hobbit orcs, not that much. I still get chills when Aragorn and Theoden make one last charge out of Helm's Deep. But when Thorin smashes a bell through the front gate of Erebor, feel confused? To the king! To the king! And at the end of the saga, I really feel like Frodo has changed, and I'm not sure Bilbo ever did. After putting the Hobbit films on a shelf, I might have put the Lord of the Rings with them. Sometimes I questioned whether I had too many nostalgic, unfair standards. But no, it really holds up. 
I don't want to take the Lord of the Rings at face value and say it's good and leave it at that. I want to know what they did cinematically that they didn't do with The Hobbit and how that affects the audience. But to be fair, let me say some things I don't like about The Lord of the Rings. Don't worry, it's a short list. The Fellowship of the Ring was director Peter Jackson's first blockbuster after making several low-budget horror films. So there are a few techniques that don't hold up, like choppy slow motion and my least favorite shot in the franchise. Last me. The wizard fight is lame. And I've never been a fan of Galadriel's siren effect. It's something I prefer about The Hobbit. In The Return of the King, Frodo gets stabbed by Shelob. <laughs> even though he's wearing a Mithril shirt. And he does this. But The Two Towers has always been the weakest. Narratively, our main characters are split up. Integrating the new characters in Rohan is a pretty tough writing challenge. And Theoden is probably my least favorite character in the trilogy. He doesn't understand the situation that he's in. Open war is upon you, whether you would risk it or not. He decides to hole up in Helm's Deep against the advice of all of our heroes. He doesn't understand Saruman's motive in the war. They do not come to destroy Rohan's crops or villages. They come to destroy his people. Down to the last child. He gets cocky during the battle. Is this all you can conjure, Saruman? When Aragorn tells him to ride out with him in one last sacrificial gesture, he says, For death and glory. For Rohan. For your people. Then in Return of the King, he says this. Why should we ride to the aid of those who did not come to ours? and he can't seem to inspire his troops. We cannot defeat the armies of Mordor. No, we cannot. I think I agree with Saruman's assessment on this one. You are a lesser son of greater sires. But despite that, Theoden still has his moments, grieving for his son, a great battle speech, and a touching death scene. I go to my fathers, in whose mighty company I shall not now feel the shame. So while there are some nitpicks, a couple of shots, and a few plot threads, it's hardly noticeable against such a cinematic masterpiece. Brett McKenzie from Flight of the Concords has a cameo in The Fellowship of the Ring, which sparked an internet phenomenon. The fans dubbed him Figwit, which stands for Frodo is great, who is that? There's even a documentary about it. Oh, Figwood lives. Yeah, I know Figwood lives. You do? Have you? Yeah, oh, that's of me. course. I'm, fi Figwood. I'm Figwood, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and because of Figwood's popularity, the role was expanded in Return of the King. My lady. And in The Hobbit as well. Except they gave him a proper elvish name in The Hobbit. In Why? Why even address it if it means ignoring the fans that made him popular? The way it shows. In just about any form of storytelling, on a molecular level, you're trying to get an audience from A to B. Start to finish, scene to scene, one emotional state to another. The Hobbit films almost always have a B without an A. They know what needs to happen, whether it's an action scene, dialogue, or character arcs. And individually, most of the scenes are great. They're edited well, the music is swelling, and everyone's acting their heart out. But I'm not feeling anything. Yeah, the bad stuff is bad, but the good stuff isn't working either because I'm missing the context that makes an emotional state believable. So let's take a death scene, the bread and butter of drama. You've got your hero, you've got your villain, and you've got other heroes to watch it happen. This is a great opportunity to make your audience cry, or shock them at least, to let you know that the bad guys mean business. And the scene itself is pretty good. But it negates any emotional resonance because I don't know anything about Feely. He's always there in the background, but he doesn't actually participate in conversations, so I don't feel like I'm losing anything. Across three films, Feely has 61 sentences. And keep in mind, those sentences are usually something like, Feely! 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 For comparison, a similar character like Aemir, who doesn't die, has 71 sentences across two films. Some of those are commands, I guess. We ride north. But he also has some really great dialogue. And the fear takes him, and the blood, and the screams, and the horror of battle take hold. Do you think he would stand and fight? And he's memorable in other ways. His helmet is like the coolest thing ever. Go hit him! The Rohirrim saves the day at Helm's Deep. He takes out two Oliphants with one spear. <laughs> And if 
he never spoke, this scene would still be heartbreaking. Is he deep? No, but he functions in the story and he makes you feel a certain way. With Feely, I don't know what to think about him. If your secondary characters don't speak, then you're conveying to the audience that they're not important. A dwarf like Nori gets four sentences. Bomber only gets two sentences. No, he's not. There you go, cousin. And I don't buy for a second that it's because there are too many characters. I'm a fan of me, tubers. Lord Elrond is not here. Excellent taste in wine. No, 13. You're me, Boris. What do you know, my wife? Edlen and Tauria. You're a weasel. Somewhere for Fatty to put his feet on. <laughs> there you go, cousin. Okay, let's try a comedy scene. You know where you can stick that. So the situation is that the dwarf Biffer has an axe stuck in his head, which causes him to speak in the dwarf language, Kuzdul. When the axe is finally removed, he can speak English again. Bye, Durin. You've lost your axe. So what do we need to know for this joke to work? Well, we need to know that he has an axe in his head. I mean, the axe in his head. Check. We need to know that he can only speak Dwarvish. Okay. Um, well, that's all he says. There's the old adage, two times is a coincidence, three times is a pattern. And we never get a third line out of him. We also need to know that the axe is the reason he speaks Dwarvish. The closest we get is dead. No, only between his ears. His legs work fine. Which says nothing about his language impairment. And finally, we should probably know how Biffer feels about the axe before it's removed. But we're not told anything about Biffer throughout the trilogy, so how's this supposed to be funny? They've effectively told a punchline without a setup. You know where you can stick that. For comparison. That still only counts as one! If you've seen The Lord of the Rings, you probably already know the setup because they repeat it over and over. I'm on 17. Legolas and Gimli have been counting their kills in battle since the Two Towers. Final count, 42. 42? Oh. And they reinforce that setup immediately before the joke happened. 33. 34. So pick any scene that feels fake or forced or melodramatic or confusing and trace it back, and it probably leads nowhere. In a pivotal final scene with our three elven characters, Legolas decides to leave Mirkwood forever. I cannot go back. Thranduil parts with his son, and then he validates Tauriel's love for Keeley. Why does it hurt so much? Because it was real. Except nothing is in place for this scene to work. The tacked on love story is obvious because there's no way they can develop a relationship in a story that's constantly moving. But the idea is that Thranduil is now seeing himself in Tauriel because he lost his wife and buried the grief. His sympathy is also a reversal of an earlier scene. What you feel for that dwarf is not real. But there's never a moment where Thranduil finds out that she's in love with Keeley. He just knows because everyone else knows at this point, including an orc. The Blackhead Archer. We stuck him with a Morgul shaft. Poison's in his blood. Legolas knows, but he's not validating her love. We're also supposed to assume that Thranduil's isolationism is a result of losing his wife. Other lands are not my concern. But the only mention of her is this. My mother died there. And Legolas leaves the woodland realm, but we're not told why. Was it the war? Tauriel? His mother? His father? All of these reasons are flimsy. If it's the war, I don't buy that a ninja like this would feel that devastated. If it's Tauriel, nothing about their relationship changed. If it's his mother, it's irrelevant. Your mother loved you. And I'd like to think his father's ideology spurred something different in Legolas, like he discovered his humanity by contrast. But we're only shown two scenes with Legolas and Thranduil. One where they interrogate an orc together. There was more the orc could tell us. There was nothing more he could tell me. And another where he defends Tauriel. He had neither thought. Ulukenithon. So the father-son goodbye doesn't work because there's no father-son relationship. I think all of this could have been fixed if the studio-mandated love story had been between Legolas and Tauriel. They could have actual love scenes together. 
Thranduil could find out about it. And if Tauriel died in the battle, then there'd be a thematic parallel between Thranduil and Legolas. So then he would have a motivation to avoid being like his father and do something selfless. And you have my bow. But instead, we're given three or four B endings without any proper beginnings. Because it was real. Or vice versa in some cases. In the second film, they make a concentrated effort to set up a dwarvish wind lance. Thorin stares at it. There's a long lingering shot on it. A dwarvish wind lance. And Balin uses it to talk about Bard's ancestor. Only a black arrow fired from a wind lance could have pierced the dragon's hide. Got it. Bard's going to use it to kill the dragon. But it's not in the third film. At all. I thought it might have been destroyed by Smaug, but they don't show that. Bard fires a series of arrows, and when his bow breaks, he builds a makeshift wind lance using his son. I think it would have worked better if he used the wind lance first, and when it breaks, he has to use his own strength and his old-fashioned bow to fire the black arrow. That seems more natural to me. Even getting from scene to scene feels like the writers are twisting their arm. Like, how do you set up Radagast, a character that's completely removed from the main action? Can't you do something about this deluge? It is raining, Master Dwarf. If you wish to change the weather of the world, you should find yourself another wizard. Are there any? What? Other wizards? There are five of us. The greatest of our order is Saruman, the White. And who is the fifth? Well, that would be Radagast, the Brown. He keeps a watchful eye over the vast forest lands to the east. And a good thing, too, for all his evil will look to find a foothold in this world. It's not terrible, it's just inorganic. Do we need to set up Radagast? He gives us a flashback later, anyway. They came from Dol Guldur. Okay, so how do we get from our framing device into the proper story? The natural thing would be for old Bilbo to start writing about himself, cut to a shot of his pen, then cut to young Bilbo. But that would take Frodo out of the movie. So instead, they reference Frodo meeting Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. He'll give us quite a show, you'll see. Right then, I'm off. Off to where? He's farthing woods. I'm going to surprise him. Which doesn't match continuity. Frodo, the door! And then somehow they have to bring it back around to Bilbo. Well, go on then. You don't want to be late. He doesn't approve of being late. <laughs> Not that I ever was. In those days, I was always on time. I was entirely respectable and nothing unexpected ever happened. Again, it's not terrible, it's just a roundabout way of getting somewhere simple, which is The Hobbit's biggest problem. So The Lord of the Rings never uses titles for dates or settings, and The Hobbit does it three times. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but it does lead to a separate complication. The Hobbit takes place 60 years before The Lord of the Rings, according to the title card. And how long has it been since anyone has seen the dragon? The dragon Smaug has not been seen for 60 years. Oops. That's a tidy coincidence that could have been ambiguous if there weren't any title cards. So maybe the character arcs are unfulfilled, and maybe some of the dialogue is clunky. But on a primal level, we're human. We should be able to relate to a situation by basic empathy, exhilaration, and fear. I think the most successful moments in The Hobbit are in Mirkwood. The forest is nauseating and claustrophobic. The spiders are creepy. <laughs> Though it does bug me that a spider talks after Bilbo takes the ring off. <laughs> Obstacles in a film are why we're here. We're here to see dragons and spiders and bears. Oh That's what the book is, a series of obstacles. But the films have so many melodramatic obstacles that they're boring. There's a reference to Balin's age early on. Old warriors. But that's not really an issue, ever. I am too old for this. When the company finally reaches the top of the mountain, they have to find the keyhole using the last light of Durin's day, which they assume is sunlight. But the sun goes down, the dwarves give up, and they start climbing down the mountain, until Bilbo figures out the last light is referring to the moon. It's the light of the moon, the last moon of autumn! 
it's five extra minutes. And my mentality is this. We've been watching for five hours at this point. We've sat through CGI antics, annoying characters, and we're ready to see the dragon. Why pretend like you're not going to do that? We've lost the light. There's no more to be done. Don't create an obstacle if the obstacle isn't interesting. I don't need to see Bilbo almost falling, or Thorin almost falling, or the dwarves almost falling, or Gandalf almost falling. It's inflation, and it bleeds all over the action scenes. One example is the ending of the second film, which was added when they split the movies. The A to B is pretty clear. Smaug and Bilbo have a conversation, Barrel Rider. and it ends with Smaug deciding to attack Lake Town. Good. Then you could watch them die. But there's 20 minutes of action in between these two points. 20. It's a bad sign if I keep nodding off during scenes that are supposed to be exciting. And by the end of it, this... You think you could deceive me, Barrel Rider? ...is completely disconnected from the action preceding it. You can cut from A to B and it works so much better. So why are the action scenes disengaging? Well, the CGI doesn't help. I know when I'm looking at a digital double, and so do the filmmakers. And it's digital? That's how, yes, how can you tell, Philip? You're supposed to tell. <laughs> and where's that? Oh, that's a matte painting, Philip. Oh, are you kidding? Yeah, that's a fake shot. But I think disengagement is more fundamental than special effects. Action has to have its own arc. Rising tension, climax, and fallout. So let's look at three action scenes from The Lord of the Rings. The Kraken, the Moria fight, and the Balrog. Together they create a complete sequence, and they do that individually too. First, you have to build tension. Engage people before you get to the action. They introduce the Kraken like this. Do not disturb the water. It makes you wonder, what's in the water? And is there a danger of being stuck out here? The Moria fight is prefaced by a cryptic passage. Cannot get out. They are coming. The Balrog is introduced 30 minutes before you see it. Shadow and it makes you wonder what's scarier than an army of orcs? What frightens Gandalf? So we're anticipating the action before it ever happens. There's some dated CGI, but it's intense and believable, and it has a lot to do with structure. Gandalf's iconic line. <laughs> is a climax to an entire section of action and drama and tension. And after that, it's over. And we know what the consequences are. The Kraken drives them into Moria. We must face the long dark of Moria. The orcs delay them, and the Balrog takes Gandalf. Plummy, you fools! Now let's look at three action scenes in The Hobbit that should have a similar structure. The Stone Giants, the Goblins, and Azog. The Stone Giants show up by chucking a rock against the mountain. Without any mystery, the audience has to adjust, not feel. The legends are true! Giants! Storm Giants! If this is a well-known legend, then why didn't anybody talk about it beforehand? Usually people do that in movies. Folk used to say there was something in the water that made the trees grow tall and come alive. Somebody gets nervous. They say that a great sorceress lives in these woods. Warnings are made. They say a dark terror dwells in the passes above me in this morgul. Animals get spooked. <laughs> something. Search to the back. Caves in the mountain are seldom unoccupied. I like the way they prefigure the goblin trap. It's pretty good. But all that tension is obliterated by the time they slip and slide down to the bottom. Wake up! Wake up! 
And Azog is a case of oversharing. They teased him early on, but Thorin is adamant that he's dead. That filth died of his wounds long ago. Except we see him halfway through the film. I think the audience should have found out he was alive when Thorin does. As it is, it's toothless. Azog! And so is the action. The stone giants are slow and lumbering, but the worst is the goblin fight. It starts with Gandalf doing the coolest thing in the movie. But you can't start with a climax. The dwarves should have fought the goblins first, and then Gandalf should have rescued them. Otherwise, it's a series of gags that people are going to tune out. Then Gandalf kills the Goblin King, but it's played for laughs. That'll do it. And the Pine Forest is just visual noise. The irony here is that none of it matters. The stone giants drove them into the mountain, I guess, but the rain could have done that just as easily. The goblins aren't in the battle like they are in the book, so killing the Goblin King doesn't matter. And both Thorin and Azog survive. Action has to mean something, otherwise it's an array of color and lights. You just have to try to plant these little seeds ahead, like it's laying, you know, a little bit of the rail ahead of the train, just yeah. to try to, to not make it feel like a series of just disconnected kind of coincidences and events that haven't had any, any set up, otherwise it has no emotional value or no tension. Yeah. There's a well-known stock sound effect called the Wilhelm scream, named after this character. For the most part, this is a joke sound effect, usually played when an extra gets killed or falls from a high place. And they use it in The Lord of the Rings, too. But in The Hobbit, Gandalf finds Thorin's father, which is supposed to be dramatic. Tell Thorin that I love him. Will you do that? Will you tell my son that I love him? I want to give the people who made my favorite films the benefit of the doubt. Most of the things I've been criticizing were probably caused by time restrictions and studio interference. But then there are things that no studio would ask for. I can't imagine a studio asking for more Alfred scenes. <laughs> or wanting him to die by wearing a corset, stuffing the corset with gold, hiding in a catapult, a piece of gold falling out, and launching him into the mouth of a troll. I just don't see anybody writing that on a post-it note. Or anybody asking for more songs by the Goblin King, when it was cut out of the theatrical version. You don't have to literally sing the songs Tolkien wrote. From the ashes a fire shall be woken, a light from the shadow shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken, the crownless again shall be king. As a fan, I have a problem with how these films are written, the dialogue especially. There's no room for poetry or beautiful phrasing, everything's on the nose. Let's compare the dialogue, listen to the word choices, and think about how they make you feel. First a scene about authority. With your left hand you would use me as a shield against Mordor, and with your right you'd seek to supplant me. I know who rides with Theoden of Rohan. Oh yes, word has reached my ears of this Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and I tell you now, I will not bow to this ranger from the north, last of a ragged house long bereft of lordship. <laughs> Shirkers, ingrates, rabble rousers, who would have the nerve to question my authority? Who would dare? Who? Bard, you mark my words, that troublemaking bargeman is behind all this. Or how about a love scene? You said you'd bind yourself to me, forsaking. The immortal life of your people. And to that I hold. I would rather share one lifetime with you than 
face all the ages of this world alone. They are your people. You must go. Come with me. I know how I feel. I'm not afraid. You make me feel alive. I can't. Tell him. Or how about a description of dark places? Must be getting near tea time. At least ways it would be in decent places where there is still tea time. We're not in decent places. This is not a nice place to meet. No. It is not. Maybe it's unfair to compare the films, but sometimes it sounds like they're copying The Lord of the Rings. I have not passed through fire and death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm. You witless worm! You're not eating. You barely sleep. He doesn't sleep. He barely eats. Send word for the women and children to make for the mountain pass and barricade the entrance. I need you to gather the women and children, take them to the Great Hall, and barricade the door. But the Lord of the Rings aside, The Hobbit has a couple of weird internal patterns. They use the phrase, what on earth, six times in the first film, and nowhere else. What on earth are these? What on earth are you doing? What on earth is the matter? What on earth is the matter? What on earth are you doing here? How on earth did you get past the goblins? They also use the word fell several times, meaning vicious or cruel. Fell things creep beneath those trees. It is a fell place, Tauria. If that fell kingdom should rise again, but in one scene, they use three different definitions of fell in less than a minute. Fell things are drawn to his power. The dead had been seen walking near the high fells of Rudhauer. When Angmar fell, the men of the north took his body and all that he possessed and sealed it within the high fells of Rudhauer. Somebody should have caught that in the script, but I guess that's hard to do when you're using a flashback from the first movie. When Angmar fell, the men of the north took his body and all that he possessed and sealed it within the high fells of Rudal. I want to try something. Watch this scene and tell me why Thranduil has brought his army to Erebor. I came to reclaim something of mine. The white gems of Laskalan. I know an elf lord who will pay a pretty price for these. Please, wait! You would go to war over a handful of gems? The heirlooms of my people are not lightly forsaken. Thranduil wants the gems, that's pretty clear. But I actually took a line out. There are gems in the mountain that I too desire. White gems of pure starlight. That voiceover is from the second film. And honestly, I have no idea why they thought it was necessary. I hesitate to say they dumbed down the language, but that's what happened. It's nothing but exposition. Go here, do this, be here, hurry, come on, this way, let's go, after them. There's no room to breathe, no room to sit with the characters. Have you ever seen these Aragorn? White Tower of Echthalion, glimmering like a spike of pearl and silver. Its banners caught high in the morning breeze. Ever been called home by the clear ringing of silver trumpets. Ironically, my favorite moment of dialogue is between Keeley and Tariel, because they're talking about something other than the plot. I have walked there sometimes, beyond the forest and up into the night. I have seen the world fall away, and the white light forever fill the air. The words are beautiful and everything else is just an old cadence over a typical blockbuster script. I wanted The Hobbit to have the same magic as The Lord of the Rings, but I think we've overlooked how hard it is to make a great trilogy because it looks so effortless. I still think there's a lot to like about The Hobbit. It's just buried under awkward storytelling. After my first video, I really thought I was done with The Hobbit. And maybe that's how the filmmakers felt about Lord of the Rings. But now I really am done. And I don't expect I shall return. In fact, I mean not to.